Okay. Uh, you can probably kill the lights, whoever's leaning on that light switch. You guys hear me okay? All right. All right, so this, uh, this talk's um, called Microsoft just gave the blue teams tactical newts and how red teams need to adapt. So um, I'm Chris Thompson. I'm the red teaming or ops lead at IBM X-Force Red. Uh, my job involves conducting red team operations against really large banks and defense contractors and more mature targets. Um, I actually graduated uh, from SAIT uh, about a dozen years ago, um, and I, I teach uh, the network and mobile pen testing class at night here. Um, I probably hold the, you know, probably some unofficial record for the most F-bombs dropped by an instructor here. Um, but but we, we do have a lot of fun in the class. Um, my main goal from teaching at night at SAIT is uh, just to help to grow out Calgary's local uh, technical security community. Um, so if that's, uh, if you're kind of offensive minded or defensive minded, please uh, come on out. We meet uh, every month, uh, second Thursday-ish of the month at the Bank and Baron uh, down in the basement most of the time. But check our Twitter feed for the right, right info. So why this talk on Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics and Threat, prep, threat Protection? Um, you know, Andrew had that quadrant up uh, about different research, uh, you know, why, why people are driven by different research. His quadrant kind of lacked the beer-driven research. I was just kind of saw that something was coming out from Microsoft, and I, I thought nobody was taking a look at it. Um, so I wanted to spend some time on it. Um, I've come up against some really good distraction. Uh, or when I've been testing some large Fortune 50s lately, I've come up some really good uh, against some really good detection strategies. Um, they've got tools like Sysmon and App Locker and Emit in place. They've got Event Lock forwarding. Um, they're using products like CrowdStrike and Silence uh, for host behavior analytics and tools like Rapid7 User Insights for domain behavior analytics. So when I saw that Microsoft is coming out with both uh, host and domain-based uh, analytic tools and that advanced threat protection was going to be built directly into Windows 10, uh, I knew this was an area that needed some more focus, especially uh, when these products are further integrated this fall, um, like we just saw with uh, this Tuesday's fall creator update in Windows 10. So I gave the original version of this talk at DEF CON, which was the first talk on evading and bypassing ATP, and was only the second on uh, ATA. Uh, Nicole, uh, Nikhil, sorry, uh, had just presented on ATA two days before my, my uh, DEF CON talk. So there was a bit of similarities in our research, but we, we also found quite a lot of different things, so that was great to, to get some different perspectives on the product. Uh, and because we're, we're so early in the history of these products, uh, I've withheld a few techniques that I'm presenting later at Black Hat Europe um, in a month-ish. Um, so check uh, my Twitter feed, and I'll, I'll put a few more out there. Um, so to kind of set the stage, when I developed our TTP, or tactics, techniques, and procedures for the IBM X-Force Red Team, uh, I put a really distinct emphasis uh, between host and internal recon. So those are very distinct phases. Um, and you'll see why when we start to deal with products like ATP and ATA in a minute. Um, and really, to become better red teamers and, and operate against more mature blue teams, we need to gain a solid understanding of what indicators of compromise our tools and techniques are leading be leaving behind. Um, you know, what commands might be caught by different script logging, what's flaggable by Sysmon, and, and more importantly, how we can learn to use techniques that can avoid uh, user behavior analytics. So my lab setup, uh, real quick, uh, it's not running on an old compact Viserio. Uh It's running a couple dozen boxes. Um, Cybera from Alberta is actually uh, giving me all that space. So if anyone from there is here, thanks a lot. Um, I tried to run the commands against his, you know, multiple different forests and domains and hosts just to verify the accuracy. Uh, but that being said, it is a test environment, so it's hard to replicate real-world corporate domain traffic, um, especially when we're bringing in 
behavior analytics because um, you know we're, we're, we can simulate regular user behavior as much as we want in a lab, but it, it might differ for obviously from what's in, in the real world. So to give an uh, overview of ATP, this was the original uh, dashboard. Now you can see alerts on the left, talks about the status of different machines. Uh, it's active on more than 2 million devices right now. They get almost a billion security events a day that they go through. Um, this is the cloud dashboard of ATP uh, that everything reports into. Uh, and ATP uh, provides uh, host behavior sensors similar to products like uh, CrowdStrike. Um, the difference that is that these sensors are built and embedded directly into Windows 10. Pro and Enterprise, um, and uh, the second release came out 1703 in the spring, and release three was just bundled with two days ago's fall update or Windows 10 1709. Um, these sensors collect and process behavior signals uh, from the box. For example, uh, they process the registry file and network communications, and they send all this sensor data or telemetry data to the cloud for further processing. Um, you know, sometimes these alerts can happen as, as soon as five minutes. Sometimes because they're chugging all the data in the cloud, it might take a few hours. Um, attackers could use that to their advantage if they're going for a quick smash and grab, but because we're talking about more mature targets so that it's gonna be hard, to do that type of smash and grab, uh, we gotta go low and slow. And we need to go with a more mature uh, methodology. Um, so this is the, you know, if you're investigating alert, there's PowerShell Empire being uh, launched. Uh, we can see that even though it was a encrypted or obfuscated, sorry, payload, um, it, it uh, deobfuscates it on the fly and shows exactly how it was launched. If there's lateral movement from that box, it talks about where it moved to and what uh, processes or techniques were used to perform lateral movement. As a blue team, you can see, um, you know, the hash associated with that initial um, payload and you can see it hit two machines. You get the option to quarantine those machines and then you'll see that pop up um, if you were one of the infected users. Um, release three that, that again just came out on Tuesday. Um, it was expanded to include uh, Windows Defender antivirus, um, the new advanced threat protection or ATP. Um, it also came out as uh, Windows Defender exploit guard. So if anyone's used Emit, this is the new Emit. Um, it's now Windows Defender application guard, device guard, firewall, and credential guard. Um, the third version that just came out also provided um, expanded support for operating systems. So some initial support for 2012 and 2016, sorry, 2012 R2 and 2016, and a bit of Linux support as well. Um, and, and really the focus of this um, release three was to consolidate the entire Windows 10 security stack into a single pane of glass. So you, if you have some binoculars up there, you can see that we have device guard, firewall, cred guard, all those technologies I talked about reporting in for all the devices we see by OS, we see which ones are missing patches, we see you know, uh, certain exploits being launched or certain payloads being caught up in the top left corner. And now in release four, uh, Microsoft bought a company called Hexadite and a lot of Hexadite's IP was around auto-remediating some of these things. So, um, if an initial infection is, is found, it's going to automatically analyze you know, all the files and processes and services and drivers on that infected device. It's then going to look for certain IOCs. It's going to look at different endpoints across the network uh, that might have had these similar IOCs. And then it's going to auto-quarantine or mediate them. So it might use Windows Firewall to block uh, command and control traffic to the attacker's box. Um, it might, you know, remove a file. Um, if there's more advanced options that need to be taken, it'll wait for the operator's approval. Um, but, you know, pretty interesting stuff that's coming out the pipe from, from Microsoft. 
So far from automating defenders out of a job, I think especially for smaller shops, this type of product will really help them to augment their in-house capabilities and allow them to free up some time to really start to focus on more advanced uh, threat hunting. So if we actually look at advanced threat protection in play, um, you know, here's uh, launching an obfuscated uh, PowerShell command. It's caught. Um, here's launching a much more heavily obfuscated command. It's still caught. Um, this is, you know, when we talk about PowerShell Empire, a lot of Cobalt Strike payloads, a lot of them are based in uh, PowerShell. So when you take things like the obfuscated Empire project and whatnot, this is still going to catch them, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, so with PowerShell, Microsoft gave us this amazing framework. Um, attackers have been favoring using PowerShell, the executable, PowerShell the core, or the Windows management framework, um, for several years because it's so flexible and because it's so easy to use. Uh, we've seen some awesome tools as attackers come out, uh, you know, frameworks like Empire, tools like PowerUp, Unmanaged PowerShell, PowerSploit, Nishang. Uh, PowerView, User Hunter, and Bloodhound, and all of these, you know, are, a lot of these are, are deeply connected with, with PowerShell. But now that Microsoft, you know, got us all developing tools and attack frameworks on top of PowerShell, they started to implement heavy logging and heavy deobfuscation technologies into PowerShell. So they're trying to take those shiny new tools that we've all come to rely on away. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with with um, all the new improvements uh, around Windows Management Framework 5, here's some are. So, you know, we're, we're doing uh, PowerShell script op logging, trans transaction and transcription logging. It's looking for suspicious strings. It's uh, enforcing and constrained language mode. It's got the anti-malware scanning interface, which can put all the obfuscated PowerShell commands through to the antivirus engine and check those for malicious signatures. Um, but, you know, I won't spend too much time on these, but if you are, you know, in offense or defense, you really should be familiar with these, um, especially as they're becoming more core to the, the security stack. Um, and because PowerShell, or sorry, Windows 10 and ATP are uh, enforcing Windows Management Framework 5, you can't even downgrade to PowerShell version 2 anymore because they've removed it altogether in the latest creators update. So that was a favorite technique to downgrade to to get around all those new technologies I just talked about. Oh, we'll just go back to an earlier version of PowerShell and get around all that. You can't do that anymore because they've removed support for PowerShell version 2 in the latest update. Um, so common techniques that also leverage like uh, WScript shell are also caught. You can't use not not PowerShell and just call the Windows Management Framework directly because, um, you know, it, it's all forced to use the, the version 5, which has all those technologies. So, you know, we, we start to see that attackers' common techniques are being caught uh, across the board, you know, um, and it's pretty good at detecting a lot of these um, signed binaries that are used to launch malware executables, it's pretty good at detecting abnormal behavior that, you know, maybe you're connecting out to a newly registered domain or to a Tor service. Um, and so a lot of the initial execution or attack vectors that, that we're performing are getting caught. But, you know, there, there are some options for uh, gaining initial foothold. Um, we can use obfuscated Java or VB script payloads that don't have kernel 32 API declarations, so just like Cactus Torch. Um, we can use signed execs to load uh, Cobalt stageless payloads, uh, or we can, you know, continue with either encrypted or obfuscated uh, techniques that are used by Veil or Shelter to get around some of these. But the the challenge doesn't stop about on getting on the box initially. That's the easy part. We can all, you know, fish somebody and get on the box initially, and maybe that payload's caught, maybe it's not. Maybe we've used some uh, crazy technique that just came off of Twitter that morning, um, and, and ATP hasn't been updated yet. The challenge is not getting on the box initially. The challenge is uh, the commands and tools that you need to run after you get on the box. So 
how do you perform new process creation without getting caught? How do you check for privilege escalation? Um, how do you check for vulnerabilities on the box to actually escalate your privileges on the box and, and take over it? Um, how do you get around preventative controls like UAC and AppLocker and Emit and constrained language mode and PowerShell logging when it's all going through the PowerShell and, uh, or sorry, the ATP uh, sensor? So, um, you know, as an attacker, some of these commands might look familiar to you uh, for doing host recon. So understanding what's on the box, understanding what antivirus is in place, uh, seeing what programs might be vulnerable on the box, who the users are, more info about the system. But these are all uh, pretty much caught if run in the same time period. Um, so instead of, of you know, using these typical commands, we need to move towards different opportunities like using uh, WMI. So we can, we can get around um, detection by just using WMI, um, either uh, through the WMI command line, WMIC, or calling the WMI schema directly. Um, I spoke to Microsoft, uh, and they're looking to uh, really improve uh, WMI detection in the upcoming spring release. Uh, apparently, they've put some detection into just Tuesday's update, but I haven't had a, a chance to test it out yet. Um, also not detected um, is if we kind of go back to living off the land and using host-only information gathering techniques that directly call window API Windows APIs through raw sockets, like Meterpreter uh, has got the uh, Railgun uh, post module. But before you use those, you want to make sure that those Metasploit modules are only using local API calls. Um, when you use stuff like local admin search that's going across the network, um, and that, that could be flagged. Um, they also use an, a lot of non-host only APIs in those scripts, so you want to review them first. Uh, Cobalt Strike has a number of uh, met modules that are also API only. Um, and we also want to make sure that, again, we're, we're sticking to focusing on host recon and not going out against the network because we might get caught by ATA. Um, so if we look more at common uh, antivirus or bypass techniques, a lot of these won't work. Um, as an admin, you might be able to modify the registry, but that won't take effect until the next reboot. Um, you could also modify file permissions, maybe, but it's super noisy and easy to detect. Um, and unlike other uh, next-gen AV products like CrowdStrike, you can't just uninstall them from an elevated command line um, because it actually requires a signed uh, offboarding script to uninstall ATP. Um, and the reason you can't stop these even as system is, is due to Protect Process Lite, or PPL. It's a mechanism that was introduced in Windows 8.1 that transfers many of the security restrictions applied to the system process to user mode processes. But it hasn't been widely implemented until just now. Um, the binary is signed by a Windows cert um, with the Windows PPL verification cert. Um, the extended key use property there. Um, and after the process is launched as protected, Windows uses code integrity to only allow trusted signed Microsoft code to load into that protected process. Um, 1703 or Windows 10 1703 um, also added the binary signature policy, which helps um, mitigate some um, process injection techniques as well. Um, if you want to know more about PPL, Alex Ionescu um, has extend, extensively covered PPL in older blog posts of his, but until now, again, we haven't seen PPLs widely implemented. So um, James uh, Forshaw uh, had a, from Project Zero, came out with a PPL bypass specifically for Windows Defender PPL. Um, and you could basically... Uh, modify the trusted installer path to say, when I launch trusted installer, I'm stopping Windows Defender and deleting Windows Defender service. And then I start it. And so that was a great bypass. Uh, it doesn't work uh, it's since uh, the spring release for ATP because um, ATP now runs at the Windows PPL level instead of anti-malware PPL, which Defender does. 
And the process is configured as not stoppable, which is key, which we'll show you in a minute. And when you try to modify that, um, you, you are getting flagged by ATP, as you see at the bottom there. So the ATP sensor communicates using the Windows telemetry service, the, the same thing that everyone was complaining about on the internet, you know, three years ago when Windows 10 came out, how there's so much telemetry data being sent. Well, this is how they're implementing it. Uh, telemetry uses the Win HTTP services, uh, and that ind API is independent of your proxy browser settings. But however, um, it will follow proxy settings within the uh, user registry that, that any user can add things to. So we can simply just add a registry key that says, use my sinkholing proxy script. And what that script says is anything that is going to the Microsoft domains there for ATP, put them, sinkhole them all to the local box, otherwise return them directly to the internet so you're not uh, impacting regular traffic. Now this um, technique apparently might have been fixed just now. Uh, I haven't had a chance to properly test it yet. Um, I do have another unprivileged technique, but I'm saving it for, for Black Hat once I've had more time to disclose it to Microsoft. Um, but when we talk about privilege techniques, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes recently from, from Matt Graber. Um, and it can apply to a lot of different technologies along the kill, or, or a lot of activities along the kill chain. Um, a lot of bypass techniques rely on having privileges on the box. And while defenders can do their best to reduce the number of users with local admin and harden their box, it's inevitable that at some point in the future an attacker is going to fish one of your users with an exploiter technique that your org didn't patch in time, or maybe some configuration abuse to become local admin once they get on the box. Um, it's extremely important that defenders implement redundant detection controls on a box so that if an attacker does manage to initially get on that box as a local admin or quickly upgrade their privileges um, and disable ATP or CrowdStrike, for example, you also have redundant logging controls in place that use things like Sysmon and WMI logging and are sending those all through Windows Event Forwarding. And with Windows Event Forwarding, it's all free. You can pick it up on a network share that's protected and analyze that data in your SIM. Um, so you, you really want to make sure you have these, these redundant logging in place in case somebody has privileges on the box. But with that said, here's some privilege techniques for disabling ATP. So um, even though ATP was a PPL in release two, uh, the diag track or the telemetry service was not, so you could just stop it. Um, in Tuesday's release, uh, they did apply a PPL not only to Diag Track, but to Windows Firewall and another, a couple of other services. Um, but they didn't flag them as not stoppable. So we can still kill the telemetry service by using James's technique to both stop Diag Track, but more importantly, um, to stop the service from ever running again. So we can stop it, but ATP is going to start it right back up in five minutes. So importantly, we need to change the executable to Diag Track to just some blah. So that way, when ATP goes to start Diag Track so it can send out all its alerts to the internet, we, we just say, no, Diag Track's, we, we've, we've killed it. Um, another favorite technique of mine, uh, this is a script I wrote, um, basically, Similar to the, the proxy settings, we take all the uh, destination URLs for Microsoft, we search the IPs, and then we add a block uh, on the Windows Firewall. So we're actually using Windows Firewall, Microsoft's product, to block Microsoft's other product. You know, and, and this technique works really well to also block WinRM, uh, Sysmon's uh, alerts being sent by Windows Event Forwarding, SCOM, you can use the same technique about against other cloud-based next-gen antivirus like CrowdStrike, where if you know their destination IPs, you can block them. Um, and, and Sysmon, or sorry, Windows Event Forwarding is even easier because instead of having to know the destination in advance, you just set the, the process, the origin, originating process. The reason I didn't set the originating process is uh, ATP or its its various um, executables is because Microsoft keeps putting out new redundant methods in place. Like 
release three, I, I just found a new DLL called Mirror, which looks to do some other background communication. So instead of trying to play cat and mouse and keep blocking all those different new ATP processes, I'm just blocking the destination. Um, James uh, also put out an awesome technique um, to become trusted installer itself. You know, if you had a Metasploit shell and you became system, you could um, take over trusted installer, but I think that whole process is a lot noisier than this. Um, this is basically just saying debug the privilege um, and start a new process as trusted installer. And once we're trusted installer, as we can find here, we've added ourselves to that privilege. We can just rename um, ATP executables that aren't currently in use. So one of those is the sent CNC proxy, which uses Diagtrack to communicate out to the internet. And because it's only called every five minutes, it's not currently in use, so we, we can modify the, the executable. We can just say, oh, we'll, we'll rename it to blah, and that way the next time ATP goes to communicate out and send an alert, it, it can't launch that process and it can't connect out to the Internet. Um, another thing we can do, uh, I found in, um, there is not very well documented PPL removal function in Mimikatz, um, which allowed you to remove PPL protection. Um, it was originally intended so you could inject into LSAS and steal all the credentials, um, but uh, it uses a kernel mode driver to target uh, those PPLs. So we do have to, to launch a, or run a kernel mode driver, um, but because sense is listed as not stoppable, um, we can first remove the PPL protection and then we can you know, basically do a kill-9 or task kill uh, and, and just kill the process outright. Uh, and from that point on, we can disable the service or what else we want to do to it. So um, out of all those different kind of techniques, I think Windows Firewall is the easiest, best approach. Uh, it's very fast. It doesn't require escalating the system to become trusted installer. It doesn't require some Mimikatz kernel mode module. Um, and once we've blocked ATP and event log forwarding and Sysmon and SCOM or whatever is running on that box, we can do whatever we want to the box and, and the blue team's not going to be none the wiser. Um, the problem with using Windows Firewall and why you might want to use those other techniques is because when organizations have implemented other third-party firewall products like, say, um, McAfee HIPS, it takes the place over Windows Firewall rules. And you can set, you know, passwords to protect McAfee hips. And by the time you've removed all that from McAfee hips, you've created enough noise and alerts gone out, you've been caught. So you might want to look at some of these other techniques instead. But, you know, we're not worried about creating uh, noise on the, the box itself. We're more worried about alerts going out to the internet or ATP flagging network traffic. So now we can actually, you know, we're at the point where we have control, we have an initial foothold in the organization, we can run whatever we want against the box, we can run whatever we want from the box. We need to start looking at being stealthy against, or stealthy for what we're running from the box against the rest of the internal network. So Microsoft put out a product called Advanced Threat Analytics. Uh, it captures traffic to domain controllers, uh, it runs as a service on the domain controller. Um, and basically, it's intended to, to catch a lot of the techniques that you see there. Um, won't go into detail on that slide, but basically, it's the current version runs in your organization. The future version, which they, they just announced, and I don't have access to it yet, because it's in a, a beta trial, is they've actually taken ATA and moved it to Azure, and now they're calling it Azure ATP. Uh, not, not ATA, I don't know why they chose that naming convention, but um, it will be living in the cloud and on-prem uh, in the near future. So here's uh, just a screenshot um, for the people in the first row. <laughs> uh, basically, you have the console, you you start to see alerts. So if somebody created a, an, a new account that had admin rights, somebody tried pass the hash, if somebody tried to create a golden ticket 
or modify a sensitive group. Um, all of that's you know going to be flagged by by ATA. Um, you might see a little alert pop up if you're the admin. Um, and it works in a couple different ways that we'll we'll look at in a sec. But here's an example alert where you can see the summary of the attack and dive deeper into details. So you can see the history of the user, uh, the time, where they moved against, what resources, via what domain controller. Um, pretty detailed. Uh, in order to um, do this, some of it is based on um, just regex, like, hey, we, we expected to see stronger encryption in use, and we didn't, so we're going to flag it. But some of ATA is based on learning behavior. So it needs to know that Bob and accounting shouldn't be connected to these DevOps servers. And over the last six months, Bob never connected to them, and now he is. We're going to set off an alert based on some other you know, machine learning as well. Um, so whenever possible, when you are on an internal network and you want to be moving laterally around the network, you want to be leveraging RDP history and PowerShell command history and whatnot so you can simulate you know, legit traffic as much as possible and avoid these user behavior alerts. Um, so now that we're at the point we can run those commands without getting flagged, let's look at the next activities an attacker would perform. So that's you know, identifying uh, infrastructure of in interest, uh, doing some Active Directory recon, um, trying to find password vaults and sensitive SQL servers and file shares and, and different in intellectual property. Um, you're trying to avoid IPS and whatnot. So often when you get on the internal network, you're, you're trying to do some DNS queries to find out you know, where the DNS servers are, what can they tell us about the layout of Active Directory, where more sensitive boxes are. A lot of that's um, going to get caught um, if you're using brute force tools like, like Fierce um, or a lot of NS lookup queries. Uh, same goes when you try to use a command like uh, net user slash domain. Um, it's going to see that you're, you're not blending in with active, regular Active Directory traffic very well and you're doing, using SAMR and doing some reconnaissance against um, LDAP. Um, and, and the reason that gets flagged is because you're looking for so many random account properties, like the full account properties, which, which no user should be doing. Um, so we need to look at a lot stealthier um, techniques to get around that. Uh, so not detected is if we initially use PowerShell to grab a list of computers, um, which is pretty normal traffic on the on the domain, and then um, remove any domain controllers from that list. Oh, sorry, stepped ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, grabbing the the different group members, grabbing the the different infrastructure, all of this is pretty regular traffic. Um, also not detecting, and this is my more, fa more preferred technique, is enumerating all of this against the local WMI namespace. So believe it or not, on the Windows box that we got a foothold on, all of this information, or most of it, as copy of it is stored in the local WMI local namespace. So we can query all the group memberships, who the domain admins are, who the you know, SQL admins are, all of that directly against the Windows 10 computer, and none of that traffic actually goes out on the local network, so there's no chance for ATP to, or sorry, ATA to catch it. Um, you know, and we can even, since um, ATP 1.8, they added different Active Directory user roles for uh, ATA admins, so we can even query for the existence of this group against the local box and know if ATA is in use in the environment or not. So that's pretty handy before we start sending traffic around the network. Um, so if we use the default user hunter or bloodhound scripts, um, and we, we query all the servers on the, the network, and we try to find out who's got a session on that file server, or that terminal server, or that workstation, and we use that to plot out uh, an attack path, by default, that's going to get caught. Um, 
you know, it's a super valuable technique, uh, and a lot of attackers are using it right now because it takes the guessing game out of trying to know what box to attack next or what workstation or what user I have to go after to get the privileges I need to get to my target. Um, so by default options, a lot of that's going to get flagged right now. Um, same with, you know, uh, using tools like User Hunter and NetSesh, that's going to get flagged as well. Um, but we can get around being flagged if we just uh, remove the domain controllers from the list of hosts that we're querying. So if we feed it a host file that we've, we've removed all the, the domain controllers out of, we can gather all of that information about every other box on the network, but just not the DCs. And because it's not, tra no traffic's hitting the DCs to find out who's logged into that box who has a session, um, ATP, or ATA can't flag on it because it never sees that traffic. Um, and then just earlier this month, um, the Bloodhound guys actually just added a flag in that says exclude DC. So that, that takes, makes my technique a lot easier because they just added it right into Bloodhound. Um, so now that we've found out where our target users are, where our target boxes are, who we need to go after to get the privs that we need, um, we can start to look at lateral movement. We can leverage all that information. So ATA is pretty decent at detecting PS exec and WMI exec against the DC itself. Um, and it may detect different lateral movement techniques just based on abnormal user behavior. So again, that's when we want to try to replicate normal traffic as much as possible. Um, SBN, her service principal name, enumeration and Kerberosing is uh, not, Kerberosing is not detected. Uh, it blends in with regular traffic too well. Um, they, maybe they'll, they'll improve this in the next release, but right now I can say, tell me where all your, your SBNs for your SQL servers are, and then give me the SBN ticket or the Kerberos uh, ticket for that service. And once I have it, um, you know, my team has uh, 16 uh, GT, GTX 1080 uh, GPUs that we can crack that, that Kerberos ticket with I within a couple of minutes. So we, we can get the credentials for any SPN service account across the network and crack them within a couple of minutes. So now we have those privileged uh, accounts that we wanted and we even know where they're used. So if I have SQL admins, and they're logged into SQL servers, I now know I'm safe to log into any SQL server because ATA is going to know that that's regular traffic. Um, and I can also avoid any authentication events to the domain controller at all by just generating a silver ticket with that service account that I just created. Um, and so, um, you know, I won't go into detail on silver tickets because we don't have too much time, but, you know, this prevents us from having any authentication event against the domain controller. This is strictly against the local SQL box or local uh, IIS box, um, and all of those logs are, are strictly on that box. Um, also not detected is abusing um, AD object uh, access control entries. So with the Bloodhound 1.3 attack path update, we can enumerate AD object access control ent entries and visualize those attack paths with Bloodhound. So not just the sessions that are on the box, but now we're enumerating uh, some random user through 20 different delegated control groups has access to this box. And instead of having a huge guessing game, we can now visualize that in, in a couple of minutes. So we can say, you know, invoke Bloodhound, give me all the, the ACLs, and Bloodhound will, let, will tell me that Abby, Ed, Abby Edward is a member of the help desk who has delegated rights to the SQL box, and they can reset the password of web service, who is then an admin to app one my target. And I can get all that information in a couple of minutes, where if you were trying to figure out this information before as an attacker, this would take like, days or weeks of guessing and creating a crap load of noise on the internal network, and this is, this is minutes now. 
So we can abuse those permissions and add ourselves you know, to the SQL admin group. And now once we're in the SQL admin group, we can temporarily reset the password of the web service and then log into the app. And again, we can avoid ATA alerts because that web service is supposed to be, be allowed to log into Apple One. Now in uh, you know, Forest, Active Directory Forest 2012 versions, you can set protected groups, but nobody does. Um, but if SQL admins was, was flagged as a protected group, ATA would flag on that because you've modified a sensitive group. Um, but, but nobody has that in, in place. Um, and Rohan, Andy, and Will from the SpectreOps crew recently covered how to reset that user's password back to their old password um, based on their password history. So, you know, if we perform this attack at, at midnight and by 8 a.m., we've set their password back to whatever it was before, nobody's the wiser that, that we actually perform this attack. Uh, check that link if you want to know more about their research. Um, so, passing the, the, the ticket or, or overpassing the hash, that's caught. Um, you'll see that you know, we're, we're passing just the NTLM value, but if we go down, we, we, look, that, we look and see that, that no, A, no AES keys are being passed, and that's how it's flagging on that, because it's expecting AES keys to accompany the NTLM hash. So we can get around that um, and not be flagged for passing the ticket or overpassing the hash to move laterally around the organization by simply just including the AES key along with the NTLM hash. And I found it was really hard to find out how to get the AES128 key. Um, so I, I found out that you could just put all zeros in there and it would still not flag on it. So as long as something is in that um, setting, you're, you're, you're fine and ATA won't flag you. Um, also not detected, uh, Nick Hill covers, covered in his talk uh, a lot of movement around SQL. And it makes sense because just like silver tickets, uh, the authentication against SQL is to the local SQL server. It's not via Active Directory, especially if those accounts aren't tied to Active Directory. They're all SQL auth. So you can target SA accounts and compromise SQL boxes and then use that and use any trust relationships between different SQL servers to move around the network and never be seen by ATA and never create an, an authentication event. Um, it's also, ATA is not very good at, look at, at monitoring between different child domains and especially child forests. It has no visibility between forests. So you have multiple forests, trusted forests in your organization. You're going to need an ATA instance in both forests and, and I believe in both uh, your major subdomains uh, for it to detect accurately. But I won't uh, repeat Nikhil's research in that area, but you should check out his link for that. So um, once you have access to these privileged users, it's now time to move towards achieving the primary goals of our red team engagement. So those may include dominance over the network, and you may or may not need to become a domain administrator. Uh, I was just testing a huge bank last, no, two weeks ago, and we got on the box, Kerber hosted, uh, got service account, was able to gain access to their SVN via the service account, uh, so their whole code repo, and demonstrated that we could gain access to this, all the bank's trading algorithms, all without ever doing uh, you know, any lateral movement or remote code execution. All of it was just via curb roasting. So you might not need to get domain admin to achieve your objectives, right? Um, but it, it certainly helps, but it comes with its own challenges. You know, your other, other objectives might be gaining access to that sensitive information or code repos like I talked about, or, or just, you know, specific financial data or, or uh, sensitive file shares. So DC sync is a common technique to grab AD, the Active Directory database. Um, which effectively you're just saying, hey, I'm a domain controller, send me a copy of the Active Directory da database. And the other domain controller says, here you go, where obviously ATA 
could flag that pretty easily as suspicious because my workstation is not a domain controller. Why am I doing that request, right? So it's pretty easy to flag DC sync. So uh, even though it was the fastest you know, and, and easiest technique to use in the past, I, I wouldn't recommend it anymore. Um, partially detected in the last, it wasn't detected all in 1.7 and 1.8. It partially detected it um, when we use the WMI shadow copy. So we're basically just doing a shadow copy, like a backup event on the domain controller to dump the ntds.dit. Um, and we can do that without having to call the shadow copy admin direct executable directly by using WMI. But this is now flagged as a low severity event in ATA, not because we got a copy of the Act Directory database, but because an attempt was made to, to connect via WMI to the Active Directory, uh, or sorry, to the domain controller. So, you know, if you saw this, you, you might, it, this is a low severity event, you might just ignore it, where in reality we got a full copy of the Active Directory database with all the, ad, the admin credentials and all the user creds and everything like that. Um, not detecting uh, another technique. Um, if we execute Mimikatz directly or, or remotely on, on a domain controller in memory via WinRM or PS remoting, that's not detected. Um, while you might be able to reproduce it, user behavior analytics might spot it, but I, I couldn't reproduce that. Um, As a blue teamer, this is pretty easy to detect if you're running Sysmon on the domain controller, um, as well as, as hardening uh, who can actually remotely log into the box over WinRM or PS remoting. So you can just block that attack path altogether. Uh, same goes with raw disk access. So if we just um, directly connect to the raw disk to copy the ntds.it dit and system file, without starting any services or processes or injecting into anything or elevating the system. Um, that's not detected either. But again, um, you can detect that LSAS injection rod disk access uh, with Sysmon. Um, just like pass the hash, uh, golden tickets are going to be detected because we're only supplying the RC4, not the AES. So if we supply the AES key, uh, we're able to grab a golden ticket and it's not flagged by ATA. Um, so some takeaways. Um, what are we doing for time? Oh, pretty much up. So um, you can grab these slides. Um, they're on the internet. But really what you want to do for, from a blue teaming perspective is implement that second line of defense. Don't just rely on that shiny tool that some sales guy pushed down your throat to, to be that you know silver bullet. You want to put in a lot of these backup detection methods. You know, CrowdStrike and ATP and all that are, are good products, but there's always going to be a way around them because people like me are motivated to get around them. And whether the technique's public or not, people are still going to be motivated. So you want to make sure that your forcing the attacker to create as much noise as possible um, so you can grab those events somewhere and flag on them. Um, you really want to integrate. I know, you know, in the past, a lot of admins are like, ah, we're on Windows 7, now we're on Service Pack 1, we're going to skip Windows 8, we'll skip 8.1. Yeah, we'll probably skip Windows 10 until, you know, we have to move Windows 7 over just because it's end of life. I highly recommend you look at how your... What's it called? Foresting? Green something? I don't know. How you're ever, ever, evergreening. There you go. Environmentally conscious term, yeah. So however you're getting rid of those Windows 7 boxes and moving to Windows 10, you instead want to look at your, your release cycle a lot better and, and say, okay, there is a security benefit to moving to, you know, release 3 that just came out. Not just a, hey, we'll plan for it in three years from now. You know, Microsoft's got this new release cycle that you should really investigate some time into and see that some of the security benefits from doing that as well. From a red teaming perspective, um, we really got to return to living off the land and only 
leveraging these awesome PowerShell tools after we're confident we can run them against the box and not get caught by PowerShell logging and all that crap. So we want to make sure we're disabling ATP and event log forwarding before we start to use those fancy tools. Uh, we really want to art review RDP and session history and whatnot so we can emulate real traffic and real users connecting to a certain box as much as possible so it's not flagging somebody for marketing connecting to the DevOps box. Um, we want to focus on a lot of information gathering techniques and lateral movement techniques that don't communicate with the domain controller and don't authenticate to the domain controller. So looking at the local WMI namespace queries, looking at Kerber hosting and SPNs and creating silver tickets and, and evading or avoiding any authentication events to, domain, uh, to the domain controller whenever possible. Um, so uh, big thanks to all those Turter hashes. Take a picture of that and follow those people. They're amazing. Um, they really helped me along with my research. This was actually the first formal research project that I did. And at times, I definitely regretted it because it was so much work. But at the same time, it was super interesting because it forced me to learn a lot of techniques. And you know, the amount of side paths I went on uh, and new techniques I learned just by picking a product and trying to attack it was, was awesome. So um, even if you just start doing research against some random new security product that's out there, with no goal in doing a talk or putting a paper out and just do it for your own benefit, I highly recommend it. So uh, thanks everyone for your time and uh, come on out to CalSec.